The Vietnam War, and a massive American aircraft carrier prepares to launch a bombing raid. Warplanes and men are crowded on deck. Then, a fire rips through a jet fighter. Seconds later, the stern of the ship is rocked by a series of huge blasts. Everyone was terrified. The sights were horrible. As fires rage, the crew begin a desperate fight to save the vessel. 17 hours later, 134 men are dead. But what caused this horrific loss of life? Now, a top Navy investigator reopens the report into one of the most famous disasters in US military history. Using computer simulations, we reveal what really happened aboard the USS Forrestal. Disasters don't just happen. They are a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down to those final seconds from disaster. Southeast Asia. North Vietnam. July 1967. America is bogged down in a messy ground war in North Vietnam. The body count is rising fast. To date, over 6,600 US military personnel have died in the conflict. President Lyndon Johnson wants to finish the job. In an all-out bid for victory, he has upped the number of bombing raids. But the war is thousands of kilometers from American soil, and bombers need bases. Vital to the new strategy are the US Navy's aircraft carriers. These massive war machines can launch air assaults from hundreds of kilometers offshore. Sailing to her first tour of duty in Vietnam is the biggest of them all, the USS Forrestal. She cost $189 million to build and has a crew of 5,400 men. Her flight deck is vast. Stood on end, she would reach the 80th floor of the Empire State Building. Forrestal represents four acres of American sovereign territory, able to travel anywhere in the world. July 29th, 8 a.m. The ship has reached the Gulf of Tonkin, 160 kilometers off the coast of North Vietnam. She has been stationed here for five days, launching bombing raids against the Viet Cong. These are dangerous waters. Three years earlier, enemy fire hit a warship just a few miles from here. In the event of an attack, the ship has eight five-inch guns with a range of 22 kilometers. In charge of these weapons is Petty Officer Milt Crutchley. Man ready. Zebra set. Milt is from Frederick, Maryland. Aye. He's just 20, but in command of two junior sailors. So far, he's had a quiet war. Oh, two and a half years I was on board Farstall. We never once fired the guns in anger or in defense of the ship. But Milt's war is about to change dramatically. <laughs> 9 a.m. A bombing mission is scheduled for mid-morning. The pilots slated for the mission head to their briefings. One of them is Junior Lieutenant Dave Dollahy. Back home in Florida, 25-year-old Dave is a single man with a hectic social life. But the discipline of the Navy made him shape up. I joined the Navy to become an aviator and grew up actually in the Navy, matured in the Navy. Flying alongside Dave on the mission will be his good buddy, Fred White. 32-year-old Fred is a family man. He and his wife, Marianne, have three young children back home in Florida. But for Fred, flying a fighter jet is his lifetime's ambition. Well, I'd like to think I was his first love. <laughs> but he loved flying so much too. Of course, it was a dream, 
a dream come true for him. The squadron commander briefs Dave, Fred, and the other pilots on their mission. Morning briefing. The target is a railway line on the outskirts of Hanoi, just south of the Chinese border. Their mission is to destroy the line and cut off a critical supply route to the enemy. They'll each be carrying two 1,000... Their commander explains that today they'll be carrying different bombs. A day earlier, Forrestal received a delivery of seven tons of missiles from the ship USS Diamond Head. The explosives are old and in poor condition, some of it dating back to World War II. When the Forrestal's weapons officer saw the bombs, he decided to get rid of them as soon as possible. Today's mission is Dave's fourth in five days, but he's relaxed about it. We didn't expect to have any trouble in, in our flying that day. It was routine. 10.30 a.m. Dave Dollarhide and Fred White cross the flight deck to their planes. The deck bristles with activity as flight crews prepare 27 fighter jets for the mission, loading them with fuel and missiles. The deck of a carrier is one of the most dangerous working environments in the world. One misplaced step can see a man sucked into an engine or blown overboard by a jet's exhaust. The ship is also a floating arsenal, packed with a deadly mixture of high explosives and fuel. In the event of a fire, one man is responsible. Fire Chief Gerald Farrier is in charge of Repair 8, an emergency response unit of specially trained firefighters. Colleagues regard the 31-year-old father of four from Arkansas as the best in the business. 10.32 a.m. As Dave completes his pre-flight checks, he takes a look at the missiles being loaded on board his fighter. One catches his eye. It's an older device, delivered yesterday. He's not impressed. The bomb was large, not designed for high-speed carriage. It had rust all over it from being in storage for a long time. But there's no time to worry. There's a tight schedule to keep. Dave and Fred climb into their cockpits and make final adjustments. The bombing mission is just minutes away. The planes are Skyhawk A4E bombers. They're fast, nimble jets able to carry 2.7 tons of explosives. Six Skyhawks crowd the port aft deck at the back of the carrier. Dave Dollarhide's aircraft is two planes away from Fred White's. Their job is to bomb the railway line, but for that, they'll need support. Over on the starboard side stand seven McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom jets. Flying Phantom number 110 will be senior pilot Jim Bangert. His job is to protect the mission by destroying anti-aircraft guns on the ground. The Phantom is twice as fast as the Skyhawk and armed to the teeth. Among its weapons are 24 Zuni rockets housed in pods on either side of the fuselage. With a top speed of 2,600 kilometers per hour and a range of eight kilometers, each two meter Zuni packs a devastating punch. Three main, four main central. 10.46 a.m. The ship swings into the wind to give its planes maximum lift for takeoff. Forrestal's steam-driven catapults hurl the first two planes into the air. They accelerate from 0 to 240 kilometers per hour in three seconds. A cameraman records the action. The Navy uses the footage to aid training and improve safety. 10.51 a.m. The planes are powered up by mobile generators. While deck crew arm the missiles and the pilots make their final checks. 10.51 and 21 seconds. Dave Dollarhide and Fred White prepare to take their turns on the catapult. Suddenly, there's a flash and a loud bang. 
jet fuel spills onto the flight deck and spreads rapidly. A massive fire rips through the Skyhawk planes. Flames engulf Fred and Dave. They've got seconds to get out of their cockpits. Or they'll burn alive. The world's biggest aircraft carrier, USS Forrestal, is on fire. Flaming jet fuel rages across its flight deck. 10.52 a.m. Pilots Fred White and Dave Dollarhide struggle to get out of their burning jets. They have just seconds to escape. In the searing heat and smoke, Dave battles to unbuckle his shoulder harness and leg straps. I was terrified about what was going on, but I understood that my life depended on me getting out of that airplane. He finally breaks free and prepares to jump, only to realize he's still connected by his oxygen core. He rips it off and braces himself for a jump of three meters onto the flaming flight deck. I just leaped out the left side of the airplane, twisted in the air, and fell on my side. Dave feels a bone smash in his lower back. He writhes on the deck in agony, unable to get to his feet. The flames spiral out of control as Fire Chief Gerald Farrier and his men race to the blazing Skyhawks. The footage shows Gerald reaching the fire first, armed only with a handheld extinguisher. He gives it a test blast to check it's working, then starts spraying it on the flames beneath the first Skyhawk. Dave Dollarhide lies helpless on the deck. The blaze creeps towards him, but he can't move. Injured men scream in agony all around him. Everyone was terrified. The sights were horrible. The fire and the, the shrapnel. Everyone was fearful that they would be next. Dave looks back at the row of burning Skyhawks. Some of his fellow pilots are still trapped. I could see people running from the fire, people still in their cockpits. Defenseless against the, uh, the fire that was around. 10.52 and 55 seconds. 94 seconds after the start of the fire, Gerald Farrier and his men are still battling the flames. A massive explosion rocks Forrestal. The shock wave is so intense, it causes a brief glitch on the ship's camera. The blast instantly kills Gerald and most of his firefighting team. Then, nine seconds later, another huge explosion. This second blast is even more powerful and rattles the supercarrier to its core. The impact punches a three-meter-wide hole in the armor-plated deck. Burning jet fuel pours through the breach into the heart of the ship. Below deck, men burn alive. In the mayhem, crew members battle to get the situation under control. Ten fifty-five and twenty seconds. The fire has been blazing for almost four minutes. In the gun control room, Milt Crutchley and his men await orders, convinced that they're under attack. From here, they can fire the ship's eight guns and fight back. Run, get some water. But black smoke seeps in and fills Joe, the room. Over here, help me seal up this door. They stuff wet rags into the door seals. Milt knows if they can't keep the smoke out, they'll die. Most people that die in fires, it's not from the flames, it's from the smoke. So even if you're away from the flames, the smoke can still kill you. Dave Dollarhide still lies on the flight deck. The time is running out. 
He's got to get away before he's burned alive by the flames. Or blown to pieces by another explosion. Adrenaline surges through his body. And despite suffering a broken hip and elbow, he forces himself to his feet. He can hear bombs sizzling behind him, but can he get clear in time? The fire was everywhere, and the thought going through your mind is to just escape. Dave makes it a few meters from the wreckage, when a third explosion blows him off his feet. Four more blasts tear the rear of the ship apart. Ten fifty-seven a.m. It's less than six minutes since the fire started, but the ship itself is now in serious danger of sinking. Condition zebra throughout the ship. Alarms sound, and watertight doors close all over the carrier. This is Condition Zebra, sealing off the damaged compartments to limit the spread of fire. But closing the hatches cuts off many escape routes. Milt Crutchley's men fear they are trapped. I'm the senior guy. They're looking to me, you know, are you going to get us out of this and alive or is, or is this it? There is one exit. A hatch in the gun control room leads to a platform on the outside of the ship. Milt calls the bridge to check if the platform is safe. Command ready, Zebra set. He's told it's a blaze. Whatever he must find a different escape route. 10.58 and 20 seconds. Crew members spot Dave Dollarhide's motionless body on deck. They haul him to his feet. To their astonishment, he's still conscious. He's dragged to safety. Just in time. They make it to the sick bay, but Dave fears the danger isn't over. We could hear the noises on the hangar deck above us, and we knew the fire was still raging. But fire is no longer the primary threat. The crew pump millions of gallons of seawater into the port hold of the ship to tackle the blaze. In a cruel twist, they're putting themselves in grave danger. USS Forrestal and 5,400 men are close to sinking. The aircraft carrier USS Forrestal is in a critical situation. She lists badly, and sailors struggle to fight fire above and below decks. Leading Petty Officer Milt Crutchley is trapped in the gun control room with his two-man team as thick black smoke fills the room. They lie on the floor, gasping for the last scraps of air. They say there are no atheists in foxholes. There's no atheists in, in, on burning ships either. I was saying a, a prayer to God, you know, to get me out of this. Milt faces a life or death dilemma. If they stay here, the smoke will kill them. If they exit via the hatch onto the gun platform, they risk being burned alive. In a desperate bid to find a way out, Milt leads his men down a smoke-filled corridor. Every door is a dead end. Milt and his men are choking. He's got just minutes to save them and himself. Lean up here, guys. <laughs> Back on the blazing deck, the shell-shocked crew now face another emergency. Forrestal's 73,000 tons is on the verge of toppling over portside. If she falls, 5,400 crew will go down with her. Frenzied crewmen rush to the fuel tanks to pump oil from one side of the ship to the other. They must get weight to starboard, or the ship will be lost. Across the deck, thousands of pounds of explosives sizzle in the extreme heat. Captain Beeling orders the crew to get rid of anything that might detonate. They jettison multi-million dollar planes and tons of bombs into the ocean. Below deck, Milt still can't find a way out, and he and his men are suffocating. He has no alternative 
but to lead them back to the gun control room. He realizes he's got one escape route left, the hatch door out onto the blazing gun platform. He's been warned an inferno awaits them on the other side, but this hatch door is their last hope. Instead of fire, there's fresh air. That first breath of fresh air, it's, it's, it's like a, well, an elixir of life, I guess you could call it. It, it just re rejuvenates you. Somehow, this section of the gun platform has escaped the blaze. Milt and his men climb up onto the deck, exhausted but elated. The adrenaline quit, and so did we. The three of us, we didn't care anymore. We'd had our thing for the day, and all we wanted to do was just sit there and rest, breathe in the air, and, and just glad to be alive. 11.40 a.m., 48 minutes after the first explosion. Finally, the crew put out the fires on the flight deck. They pump enough oil across the ship to correct her listing. But it takes another 16 hours to extinguish the fires below deck. By 4 a.m. the following day, Forrestal's commander, Captain Beeling, makes an announcement to his crew. At the end of 17 hellish hours, 134 men are dead. The carrier begins a week-long journey to an American base in the Philippines for emergency repairs. The ship's tour of duty in Vietnam is over after just five days, and the Navy needs to find out exactly what caused the disaster. What started the blaze? How did it get so out of control? what caused the multiple explosions, and why did so many men die. Now, by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal the facts behind one of the most infamous episodes in US naval history, and inspect restricted files that hold the key to the incident. The day after the near sinking of the ship, the US Navy orders an in-depth investigation the findings lead to a complete overhaul in safety procedures. This man has a professional interest in Forrestal. Commander Bob Stanley is a leading US Navy investigator. He is well placed to judge the historical impact of this disaster. Forrestal fire was a watershed event, if you will, in the terms of the amount of damage done for an accident in naval aviation history. The U.S. Navy's investigation of the Forrestal disaster is also considered a watershed. For investigators like Stanley, it's the benchmark for their profession. Stanley uses his credentials to gain access to the USS Forrestal's official investigation document. Under federal law, filming the contents of the report is forbidden, but Stanley has agreed to reopen the file so that we can learn how the original Navy investigators cracked the case. The man who carried out the Forrestal investigation was Rear Admiral Forsyth Massey. Massey is now dead, but back in 1967, the respected officer put his reputation on the line by vowing to get to the bottom of the Forrestal disaster. His most important piece of evidence is footage shot by the onboard camera. Massey orders copies of the footage. He hopes this will reveal all. The pilot landing aid television system, or PLAT, is no ordinary camera. A radar link displays the aircraft speed on a dial at the top of the picture. Footage from the PLAT camera should enable Massey to analyze the forestal disaster frame by frame. Just before the fire started, the cameraman recorded two planes taking off. Then, as he stands by to film the next takeoff, something catches the operator's attention. Quickly, he pans left and captures the fire 
as it takes hold on the rear deck. Although black and white and grainy, and suffering from electronic interference from the ship's powerful radar, the film is forensic in its detail. Massey analyzes it, shot by shot. With an investigator's eye for detail, Massey discovers a clue hidden in the footage, a clue that will be the key to understanding how 134 crew members of USS Forrestal lost their lives. In 1967, Rear Admiral Forsyth Massey investigated a huge fire on the aircraft carrier USS Forrestal. Today's top US Navy investigator, Bob Stanley, has gained access to Massey's official restricted report. I was impressed reading Admiral Massey's report that they followed the same techniques and mythology that we use today. It was a very thorough report. Stanley wants to learn how Massey solved the mystery. Massey's report reveals that an onboard camera recorded the horrifying scenes on the ship. The footage is a huge bonus, but there's one big drawback. The cameraman faces the wrong way when the fire starts. By the time he pans left, the fire is already ablaze. Agonizingly, the first crucial five seconds of the event are missing. Massey knows those five seconds could reveal what caused the fire. It is now that his obsessive attention to detail pays off. When analyzing those first five seconds before the camera swings round to film the fire, Massey spots a flash by the plane on the foredeck. He plays it back over and over. There, a clearly discernible flash beneath the plane about to take off. This fighter jet is on the runway towards the front of the carrier. But the actions of the men in the foreground don't match up with what appears to be happening right in front of them. One of them turns and points, not towards the flash, but instead in the opposite direction, to the rear of the ship. Massey is confused. The men don't react to the flash directly in front of them. Why not? He goes back to his interviews with the deck crew. They confirm that they did see a flash, but they saw it near the Phantoms on the starboard rear of the ship, the opposite end of the deck to the flash Massey has spotted. This isn't making sense. Then something catches his eye. He suddenly realizes he's been looking in the wrong place. The answer isn't in the footage, it's in the plat camera that filmed it. He discovers that the plat camera is surrounded by clear plexiglass here on the part of the ship known as the island. The plexiglass is in front of the camera lens to protect it from dirt and debris. Massey develops a new theory that this flash is actually a reflection. He believes that because the camera was filming through curved plexiglass, it captured a reflection of a flash that took place somewhere else on the ship. If his theory is correct, this flash is a reflection of the start of the entire incident. Could this clue unlock the whole mystery? To find out, Massey arranges an optical test. He arms a team of men with flash guns. He gets behind the plat camera and studies the reflections of the flashes in the plexiglass. At last, one flash perfectly replicates the original flash caught in the plexiglass seconds before the fire started. This helps him locate the exact spot where the flash happened. Now, by analyzing detailed deck plans based on the plat camera footage, and by applying basic geometry, Massey comes up with his theory as to what triggered the disaster. He reasons that the flash must have come from the Phantom at the very end of rear starboard deck. That plane is Phantom 110. It's Jim Bangert's fighter. Somehow, according to Massey's theory, 
Phantom 110 launched a rocket which struck Skyhawk plane 405 directly opposite. But this raises more questions than it answers. How could a rocket, a two meter Zuni, fire across the deck and cause such devastation? Each Phantom has a built-in safety mechanism to stop just that. Highly trained air crews follow detailed safety procedures. So what went wrong? Was it human error? An electrical failure? Or even a breakdown in the Forestal's safety procedures? With many other Phantoms in service, are more disasters lying in store for the US Navy. Massey needs to check out the safety mechanisms on Bangert's Phantom to find out why they failed. But Bangert's jet is at the bottom of the ocean. So Massey tracks down another Phantom. To understand what Massey found out, present day investigator Bob Stanley needs to trace a Phantom of similar vintage. The F-4s have been out of commission since 1996. But the National Warplane Museum in Horseheads, New York, owns a good example. It's kitted out for action like the one that Bangert flew. Each launch pod connects to the cockpit controls via an electrical circuit. When the pilot presses the fire button on his joystick, it sends a signal to the pod which launches the rocket. But on the deck of an aircraft carrier, this should be impossible due to a simple fact. As a safety measure, launch pods are not electrically connected to the cockpit until seconds before takeoff. It's only when the plane is on the catapult that deck crew ready the launch pods for combat. They do two things to achieve the connection. Crew members remove a safety pin from the pod and they plug in a device called a pigtail. Once plugged in, the pigtail completes the electrical circuit between the launch pods and the pilot's joystick. Now, if a Zuni rocket is accidentally released, as in this demonstration, it fires harmlessly out to sea. The whole system should be foolproof. So why did the safety procedures fail this time? Massey now makes a discovery. The safety pins are anything but safe. When they are in position, the safety pins act as a circuit breaker. But Massey finds out that high winds on deck can pull on the pins' ribbons, ripping them out of the holes. The crew have even found some lying on deck. And Massey's investigation establishes there was a high wind on the day of the fire. In order for this pin to be effective, it needs to be completely seated. In high wind condition, like they had that day at 32 knots, these pins have been known to come out partially and also completely. Massey believes that on the day of the disaster, the safety pin had been blown out of its position in the launch pod. But there was a backup safety mechanism. The pigtail. It's only when the pigtail is plugged in that a rocket can be fired. That's why the crew are ordered to plug them in just seconds before takeoff. But in interviews with the men, Massey discovers exactly why a Zuni rocket went off. Massey's investigation now takes him back a few weeks to Forrestal's journey to Vietnam. During training missions on the way over, Pilots argue that plugging in the pigtail while a plane is on the catapult slows down operations. If there's a malfunction, the plane has to be removed from the catapult. That holds up the other planes in the queue to take off. The pilots point out that in a combat situation, a delay like this could be fatal. Massey discovers that exactly a month before the fire, while the Forrestal was still sailing to Vietnam, the ship's weapons coordination board met to discuss the men's concerns. It ruled 
that flight crews could ignore Navy protocol on connecting the pigtails. From now on, they could plug them in not when the planes were on the catapult facing out to sea, but when they were on the rear deck facing each other. The ruling was never made official, but the crew began to act on the board's decision straight away. Once the pigtail is plugged in, then the aircraft has complete electrical power from the airframe all the way to the missile launcher. Massey now knows there was nothing to prevent an electrical pulse reaching the pod of the Phantom and setting off a rocket. Clearly, an electric pulse did activate the rocket. But where did the pulse come from? That's his next puzzle, and the biggest mystery yet. Could it be that pilot Jim Bangert pressed the fire button? Massey listens again to a recording of his interview with Bangert. Under oath, the pilot states that he flipped just one switch to turn on the plane's power. Massey decides to carry out his own checks on Bangert. He discovers that the pilot has an impeccable service record and is one of the ship's safety officers. Massey believes Bangert, but that doesn't help him trace the source of the electrical pulse. He listens to Bangert's testimony over and over. Uh, yes, sir. I started up the starboard side engine and uh, I felt a jolt and I saw... A, yeah, Suddenly, he makes the connection. A power surge. He knows the jets on Forrestal have to be powered up before takeoff by an external source. Once the mobile generator powers up the plane, Bangert needs to flip a switch in the cockpit to change the power supply from the external source to the internal system. Massey suddenly realizes this is the key moment. When you move these switches to on, that is when the missile fired. It was really the, the shift of power sources. It was unregulated there for a brief moment, giving a transient surge of power. At the precise second, Bangert flips the switch. A shower of stray electrical currents surge through the plane. One rogue current finds its way into the circuit that connects the joystick to one of the launch pods. With the safety pin out and the pigtail plugged in, the current reaches the pod and fires the deadly rocket. 56 kilograms of high explosive whip across the deck and launch disaster. It's an incredible discovery. Rear Admiral Massey now knows what caused the fire. But what he urgently needs to find out is why the fire raged out of control so quickly. Fires are a regular hazard on the deck of every aircraft carrier. On average, there's one every five days on Forrestal. Highly trained and well-equipped firefighting teams are on board to extinguish these blazes quickly. So why did they fail so spectacularly in putting this one out? Massey looks at the plat footage to investigate how the crew tackled the original blaze. When the fire first breaks out, Chief Fire Officer Gerald Farrier rushes towards the Skyhawks holding only a handheld extinguisher. Other members of his eight-man team grab the hoses. But just 94 seconds after the start of the fire, when there's a huge explosion, everything changes. Gerald Farrier dies in the furnace of flames. Five more firefighters are killed instantly. And the blast badly injures the other three in the team. In a matter of seconds, all the trained firefighters are out of action. Untrained men now fight the inferno. As the original footage reveals, they use both water and foam. But a seasoned accident investigator like Massey recognizes that this is a disastrous error. The crew should only use foam. The combination of foam and water simply doesn't work when tackling a fuel fire. The foam covers the blaze, acting as a protective blanket, but the water washes away the foam, allowing the fire to flourish. Worse still, 
water carries the flaming jet fuel on its surface. Unwittingly, the crew actually spread the fire. It was an uncontainable fire at that moment for the crews. They were overwhelmed and they did not have the training to contain the fire on the forest all. So Massey knows why the fire spread so rapidly. But this still doesn't explain the single biggest mystery about Forrestal. What caused the series of deadly blasts that killed so many crew? Naval accident investigator Forsyth Massey now knows what triggered the Forrestal disaster. A rogue Zuni rocket slammed into a Skyhawk jet. But Massey still needs to figure out the answer to the biggest mystery of all. What caused the massive blasts? Reviewing the footage of the disaster, Massey is intrigued by the actions of Chief Fire Officer Gerald Farrier. On the film, he runs over wearing no protective clothing and armed with just a fire extinguisher. What does Gerald think he can achieve? Gerald would have known that every bomb has what's called a cook-off time, the time it takes for a bomb to explode when exposed to extreme heat. The bombs usually on board a Skyhawk have a cook-off time of two and a half minutes before they detonate, giving a man with an extinguisher time to start cooling them down. But now, for the first time, Gerald Farrier must have realized he was dealing with something entirely different. The bombs burning on deck were the aging, rusty devices delivered to Forrestal just the day before. He had no idea when these bombs would go off. Present-day investigator Bob Stanley commissions an explosives expert to compare the cook-off times of these old weapons with those of the modern bombs usually carried by the Skyhawks. His tests are revealing. The cook-off time of the older bomb is over a minute less than that of the modern munition. By the time Gerald Farrier gets to the bombs, one is already split open and burning white hot. He screams at his men to run for their lives. He must have realized that they would blow up in seconds. He was not concerned about his own personal safety, and so he sacrificed his life in an attempt to save the ship. In all, seven of the older bombs on board Forrestal detonate. Had the Skyhawks been armed with their usual weapons, Gerald would have had an extra minute to prevent detonation. And that, according to the explosives expert, would have given him enough time to stop the bombs going off. If we'd have had just 60 more seconds, more than likely we would have been able to get the fire under control a lot quicker which would have prevented other weapons from going off. In his final report, Massey confirms the decision to arm Forrestal with old decaying bombs is the cause of many of the 134 deaths. The old bombs were on board because in 1967, the US military was running out of explosives. Yet the government was increasing the number of bombing missions to Vietnam. So the fateful decision was made to arm Forrestal with these older, more volatile weapons. Now, by rewinding the events of that day, and by following the evidence uncovered during the extensive investigation, we can finally reveal the chain of events that destroyed USS Forrestal and killed 134 men. 10.45 a.m. A mobile generator powers up Phantom 110 on USS Forrestal, and an armorer plugs in the pigtail. 10.51 and 21 seconds. Pilot Jim Bangert flips the power switch. A stray electric current surges through the fighter jet. The safety pin is not in position. There's nothing to stop the current as it travels all the way to the launch pod. It activates a Zuni rocket. 
The rocket crosses the rear deck of the ship, chest high, at speed. It slams into the fuel tank of another plane, a Skyhawk 405, releasing 400 gallons of jet fuel that ignite. The impact of the rocket knocks two old rusty bombs from the jet's launch pods. Each contains 453 kilograms of explosives. The first will detonate in 94 seconds. 64 seconds to bomb cook-off. Dave Dollarhide finally breaks free and leaps three meters. He lands hard, breaking his hip and his elbow. 60 seconds to cook off. Gerald Farrier desperately tries to cool the bombs. 30 seconds to cook off. Fred White is still trapped in his cockpit. 10 seconds to cook off. Gerald Farrier must have realized his efforts are doomed. The first bomb reaches cook-off point. It explodes and kills 27 men instantly. In the next four minutes, six more bombs detonate, releasing 40,000 gallons of jet fuel, which catch fire. The burning fuel pours through fractures in the deck into berthing areas below, killing 91 men. Of the 134 dead, 18 bodies are never recovered. As a direct result of the forestal catastrophe, the US Navy take decisive action to ensure a disaster like this can never happen again. Safety procedures are completely overhauled on all carriers. Old bombs are replaced with newer insulated devices and fire training made mandatory for crewmen. A new fire training center is set up in Virginia, USA. It's named after the man who gave his life trying to save USS Forrestal, Gerald Farrier. <laughs>